Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine is such a weird game because it's a spin-off based on a spin-off that also served as a westernized coat of paint for a Japanese puzzle game. Like, first of all, why was it that the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog version of Robotnik was used? Why not just regular Eggman from the games? It's not like there's anything about the cartoon that would have made it more convenient for it to take place in the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog universe. They had to make up an entirely different setting for this game to take place in anyway. And are you seriously suggesting that the robots that we face against in this game, most of whom are only background characters in the first episode of the show, are more iconic and recognizable than the actual badniks from the main series? And weirdest of all is the idea that the game wouldn't be appealing to a Western audience without the Sonic the Hedgehog branding attached to it. Like, dude, a young anime girl fighting a bunch of mystical, magical beings by playing with colored jelly creatures is just a normal video game. And yeah, I'm sure that the game sold way better than it would have if it didn't have the Robotnik branding on it, but the justification is still weird to me. Like, why stop at Puyo Puyo? You had the Fantasy Star games, why not replace the characters with Sonic characters in the West? Or Shining Force? Dude, we had things like Toe Jam and Earl and Decap Attack. I think we would have handled Puyo Puyo. Wait, is that Robotnik's fortress in the background? Where's the giant golden Robotnik statue? You adapted it into a spin-off and you couldn't even get the locations right? I also love how they couldn't be asked to change Carbuncle into something else, and they just changed his name into Hasbeen. And you're apparently playing as him? In the original Puyo Puyo, you play as Arl, while Carbuncle is just your companion creature. In Mean Bean Machine, the Puyos are changed to beans, hence the name, and Hasbeen is another bean? Even though he looks nothing like the other beans? Like, how come Hasbeen has arms, legs, ears, and a jewel on his forehead? If you're gonna commit to reskinning this game, couldn't you have come up with a better origin for Hasbeen or change the Carbuncle sprite? Also, according to the manual, the story is that Hasbeen infiltrates Dr. Robotnik's fortress to save his bean friends from the aptly named Beanville, but during every character intro for the robot we fight, we're outside his fortress. Gracious, you're here already! I'm shell-shocked! But please excuse me if I scramble your chances of seeing Dr. R. Boo! Get off the stage! I'm Coconut, and I'm Dr. Robotnik's favorite robot! Dude, you're the fourth boss in a 13-stage game. Plus, didn't Robotnik make you a janitor in the show for something you didn't even do? Davy Sprocket makes me remember the Alamo, which, as a Mexican-American man, is very conflicting. Like, really? You're gonna sit there and tell me that this big snout Patrick Star looking motherfucker is more iconic than any Badnik from the main series? I bet you can't even tell me this guy's name off the top of your head. No, go on, guess. You're wrong. His name is Squeal. Well, blow me away! As if Dr. Ra hasn't had enough stick already! Look, it's none of my business what Robotnik gets up to on a Saturday night. I don't need to know how much stick he's getting. My lord is troubled by thy success, sire. But thou art destined to proceed no further. Prepare to duel Lord Robotnik's champion. Champion? Bro, there are like two other dudes after you before I fight Robotnik. You dopey dunspots! Can't you do anything right? Now I'll have to do my own dirty work and blend those beans! Blend those beans? What are you blending them for? You can clearly see in the background that you're just... turning beans into robots. Are you blending beans into bigger beans that then go inside the robots? Because if so, we've been making a huge mistake. So, fun fact, I actually defeated Dr. Robotnik on my first try, but don't get me wrong, I 1000% admit that it was pure luck. I understand that some of you might not think that this is that hard, but for someone that already doesn't play Puyo Puyo that often, to have to play at the speed that you do against Robotnik is stupid. None of these beans are even close to resembling the Puyos. Oh 
my god, it's the exact same game, but on inferior hardware and none of the pre-battle banter. Next! Okay, wait, no, hold on, actually, because what is that Robotnik sprite? Dude looks like he's at a friend's house watching his parents have the fight that finally leads to their divorce, and he can't really call his parents because he's here for a sleepover and his parents are out of town, so he just has to sit there and listen to them argue while he eats the delicious dinner his friend's mom made, all while knowing that there's no fixing or escaping this. He just needs to ride it out and try to go to sleep while the words, yeah, well, your mom's a bitch, and I don't think Jimmy's even my kid ringing your deepest dreams, Jimmy, of course, being the kid whose house you're staying over at, while well, you wake up the next morning to have breakfast with wine glasses shattered all over the floor, and Jimmy's mom crying in the other room while you eat pancakes with fruit in the shape of a smiley face. This face really does say a thousand words. Okay, so aside from being the most blatant ripoff of Mario Paint I think I've ever seen, it's borderline a scam that this is considered a Sonic the Hedgehog game. The only time Sonic shows up in this game is one on the box art, two during the main menu in a flying saucer for some reason where you can select which environment to visit, three on the selection menu itself in every world, and finally in portraits you can place in the house level. But you're not playing as Sonic or even really interacting with any Sonic related elements within the game. Tails has a cameo as one of the elements you can set down and recolor, but that's about it. I mean, shit, this could have easily been a Toe Jam and Earl or Echo the Dolphin game. They show up just as much. And it's not even fun. You just set the scene, maybe mess with the music, and create Sonic OCs. And not even good ones, just DeviantArt recolors. This is Vile's Wales Brower. He represents the inner turmoil of my soul. So, I don't know what it was, but during this part in the tutorial, I kept doing what the game was trying to teach me, but it never let me advance. So, I thought that's just how the game was until you decided to skip it manually, but then I got the rest of the tutorial right, and it advanced the way it was supposed to, so I have no idea what I was doing wrong. Oh my god, first Chaos Emeralds, then Time Stones, then Super Emeralds, and now Chaos Rings? Pick a MacGuffin! So, in another attempt to appeal to the Western market that otherwise might not have known, we called it Knuckles is Chaotix because we were familiar with Knuckles the Echidna from Sonic 3. But in Japan, they had the right idea to just call it Chaotix because Knuckles isn't the star of the show in this game. But you want to know who is? Charmy fucking B. You made a game where Charmy B is the beast character. Can someone explain to me what the hell Neutrogic means? Because this place is called the Neutrogic High Zone, but I have no idea what the Trogic in Neutrogic means. I assume it has something to do with technology? Like it's new and electric and technological, is that why? This has to be the worst bonus stage in any Sonic game. Not only are you constantly losing rings as you fall, but the so-called bonuses are completely useless. The only things you can get are ring boxes, which would be way more useful if you weren't already losing rings in the process of collecting this box, 500 points, which... Okay, cool. A combi catcher, which allows you to freely select your partner, not that it makes much of a difference considering that it's not hard to get the partner you want in this game, not to mention the fact that you'll most likely be playing as Charmy during the whole game, minus the instances where you accidentally swap places with your partner. And the last one is a slot bonus, which slows down the slot reel where you select what level you go to, and let's talk about that. Because the slot is somehow the most pointless bonus item you can get in this game, and that's including the 500 points box. The reason I say that is because why would it matter what level you do next? You have to do them all eventually anyway, it's not like the order particularly matters unless you want to get a certain level done sooner. Which leads me to my next point, why the hell do we play these levels out of order? Not only does it make the game feel a lot less cohesive, it makes the game feel unnecessarily long. Like I said, in order to beat this game, you'd have to play all these levels anyway, and it's not like you really get to pick which level you want to play each time. Not to mention each zone is comprised of a whopping five acts each. I guess they felt like doing five acts back to back would have felt tedious and so made the slot mechanic to break it up a bit. I'd agree with that if it wasn't for the fact that theoretically you could spend most of the game without completing a single zone, making the tedium even worse. 
Let's say you've been playing this game for like two or three hours and all five zones are on Act 4. Yes, you only have five more levels to play through and each level would complete a zone, but you've been playing for two or three hours, have played through 20 levels, and haven't completed a zone yet. Of all the weird things this game does, this is the only one I really don't like or understand. You'll rarely get either of them as your partner, but Heavy and Bomb suck. Their whole deal is that they betrayed Eggman and are helping you, but all they do is either get in your way or slow you down. Somewhat related to my previous point, something else that I don't particularly like about this game is its level design. It's not inherently bad, it's just that because of how fast you'll normally be going alongside the fact that Charmy makes the level design irrelevant, none of the stages really stand out to me. Like yeah, I know Botanical Bay, Speed Slider, Marina Madness, Techno Tower, and Amazing Arena's names by heart and I love their music, but if you took a screenshot of this game and asked me what act from any given zone I was looking at, I straight up could not tell you. Man, like, I get why, but I really wish any extra blue spheres you collected carried over after the first checkpoint. Amazing Arena is the only level that kind of annoys me, because the clock is so easy to find in Act 1 that you don't really know that you have to activate it in each act in order for the level to be considered cleared. No other level has a gimmick like this, and it's already a bit of an explorative game, so to suddenly have to find not just the goalpost, but a clock and its respective switch, especially when the first one is just given to you and so you don't really give it much of a thought, just leaves you confused when you manage to find a goalpost without first activating a clock, and then the level is considered not cleared. Oh yes, I loved playing through the same special stages, except now they're in wireframe form so that I could get... 50,000 points. I love how this boss is basically indestructible, except for the damage it deals to itself by way of simply not having a fifth attack. Uh, where exactly does Metal Sonic Kai come from? Because my research shows that it's from the Dark Ring that Eggman had a Neutronic High Zone, and I'd be willing to accept that if not for the fact that every other machine he builds seems to also use the Dark Rings as a power source, not as something that straight up transforms robots. And while we're on the subject of rings, it's never exactly explained what it is the Chaos Rings we collect throughout the game do, or what they even are. It turns out that the Chaos Rings were created by the Master Emerald's power, more specifically the power of the Master Emerald Altar, which crystallized into six colored rings. This same energy was discovered by Eggman, who went on to synthesize this power to create the Dark Rings he uses throughout the game, and the only way to stop him is to collect the Chaos Rings and use them against him. In the US manual, the Chaos Rings are not only never mentioned, but Robotnik's here in search of something called the Power Emerald, which isn't a thing, and this place is called Carnival Island. I'm guessing because the localization team just completely ignored the fact that, well, Eggman built Neutrogena High Zone. It sure is. You sure you're not missing a couple O's in there? Oh! Hi, Sonic and Tails! Nice to fucking see you! You're a little late, considering that the adventure is over. What are you even doing here? And why are Sonic's legs peach-colored? People always color his arms the same color as his legs, but I've never seen someone color his legs the same color as his arms. I also wasn't going to bring it up since it originally registered as a shading thing to me, but Knuckles' chest swoosh is miscolored yellow, and I know it's not because of the shading due to his eyes and gloves not having any yellow on them. Okay, right out the gate, huh? So, Tales of Sky Patrol was originally going to be an entirely different game for a system that never saw the light of day, and you might notice that Tales has a rather... interesting rogues gallery in this game. Part of the reason why is because it's thought that in an earlier point in development, this was some kind of Disney-related game, and that when the unreleased console got cancelled, the developers, Japan System House, or JSH for short, who had already finished the game and didn't want their work to go to waste, were asked to approach Sega to see if they could put it on the Game Gear due to how close in terms of specs the two handhelds were. Sega agreed and asked that Tails be the main character of the game, which is presumably when they started to rework the art assets for the game, including the enemies. There's early footage of the game where the boss that was later redesigned into Behringer was once a character that looks a hell of a lot like Pete from the Mickey Mouse cartoons. I would assume that that means that the other bosses, and maybe even some of the enemies at some point, more closely resembled other Disney characters too, so I have to ask, why is this what JSH ended up delivering in terms of designs? A coked out bear that looks like he belongs in the Bubsy universe, a dopey looking rabbit that looks like a Looney Tune, Sonic but make him a wolf somehow before Sonic Unleashed, 
and a Disney witch in a minecart aptly named Witch Cart. Right up there with Monkey Dude. Does... Does that say... Rogram? That should say Program, because it was developed by JSH in collaboration with Simsco, a development studio that used to be a Sega subsidiary. This is absolutely the kind of game that needs a manual before you go in, because despite being a training area, there are so many things that go unexplained. Like the stupid bell. How am I supposed to know that's a checkpoint and that it's safe to ring when most things in this damn game kill me? Also, I think it's absolutely silly that mint candies are what allow Tails to keep flying. I thought it was a stamina thing, or that he revved up his tails before flying, but no, I guess his blood sugar gets too low. Wait, the first level is called Rail Canyon? Like, from Sonic Heroes? Ruin Wood is so incredibly annoying because everything is constantly flinging you around, making you go way faster than you want to, and because of how little space there is on the Game Gear screen, you are very likely to die. Speaking of dying, Tales of Sky Patrol is what I like to call a Silver Surfer kind of game because if you, you touch the top of the building, you die, you touch the ceiling, you die, you touch the floor, you die, too far to the right, you die, too far to the left, you die, you die, you die, you die, 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 die. I mean, shit, it's so easy to lose a life in this game that they had to give me an invincibility here because there's no way to fly up the wall here without hitting it. I just realized. Why is our life counter represented by a P? Our fly meter is represented by F, which I'm assuming stands for flying, but does the P stand for power? Like, each attempt is the power that Tails has left to continue, I guess? These randomly appearing balls are such a pain in the ass because they're so unpredictable and even if you're constantly shooting out your boomerang, they can come in from the top or bottom to kill you anyway. Super Mario Bros. 3 called it, said it wants its airship levels back. The last level of this game, Dark Castle, can take a deep breath and blow me. It's unnecessarily long and has everything that makes the previous levels torturous. It is so easy to die in this level that the sunk cost fallacy was the only thing that encouraged me to beat this game. I'll give it this, at the very least when you game over you don't have to play the entire game all over again because I genuinely don't know if I would have had the energy to do this otherwise. God damn it, I have to give this level two cents. I think I just had PTSD from hearing this level's music while editing this. Its fucking melody is like it's taunting me and trying to drive me insane. Man, I'm not gonna lie. This is one of those games where I feel like nothing I did accomplished anything. I don't feel glad that it's over. I just feel bad that it ever happened. Start a Tales game without complaining about something before I even get into the game. So this game is known as Tales Adventure internationally, but it's called Tales Adventures in Japan. And because that's where this game was made, that's the name on the title screen that no one on the localization team could be bothered to fix. And as a side note, this game is listed as Tales' Adventure in the 3DS version of Sonic Generations, just to add further goddamn confusion. The story of this game opens up with Tails chilling out in Poloi Forest and the Battle Cuckoo Empire literally drops bombs on where Tails was sleeping, setting the forest on fire. Miles Prower may not be a rabbit, but he sure has a lucky one's foot up his ass. How did he come out of that unscathed? Uh, no, that is not a Chaos Emerald. That is a Mario Pow Block with the letter R on it. Ah, oh, the radio from Tails Adventure. So, as you may know, Tales Adventure is, well, an adventure game, what is commonly referred to as a Metroidvania, a non-linear game where progression and sometimes even exploration is often locked behind items you acquire throughout your journey, be they power-ups, weapons, etc. I'm just gonna go ahead and give the radio a sin for infamously being the most useless item in this game, with its only purpose being to change the background music when you equip it. But the radio itself represents and is a perfect segue to the thing I dislike most about this game, and if you've been watching me for a while now, you'll know that one of my biggest pet peeves is bafflingly unintuitive game design, and this game is rife with it. And 
I don't know, maybe Metroidvanias just aren't my thing, but I feel like this game takes the cake with how poorly thought out it is to me. You're only allowed to carry four items with you in any given stage, but to use any one item, you need to constantly stop what you're doing, select the right item, and then use it accordingly. And that by itself isn't the worst thing in the world, but this game is already pretty slow as it is. Not even in the context of a Sonic game, I just mean in general. So for the game to have to slow me down even further just so I can select the right item I need makes the game that much less fun to play. But okay, the game is slow, big deal, right? Well, I'd be a lot more forgiving about how the game is paced if every item you collected was equally as valuable. Not only are certain items indispensable for completing this game, which in and of itself is to be expected, but some items have no use in a regular playthrough. And again, it's not the optionality of it that bothers me. What bothers me is that you won't know which items are optional until you need them, and you won't know you need them until you reach a level that presents a new obstacle that requires the item in question. But even that's not entirely clear. For example, in the first level, Poloi Forest, there's a set of vines that appear to have something beyond them because it's a wall that looks unique compared to the rest of the walls in this level. So you would think that you need a special kind of item in order to make it through the vines. The problem is, you don't really have any idea of what item that could be. For reference, the item you need in that case is the Napalm Bomb, don't ask, which is found on the Cavern Island, the fifth level of the game. And in this particular case, I have to ask, why do we need a certain kind of bomb to get rid of the vines when you start the game with another kind of bomb that can blow up rocks. How can a bomb that blows up rocks not blow up or set fire to the vines? But okay, that's not exactly my point. My point is, you are able to collect so many different items in this game, but you can only go in with four at a time, meaning you have to carefully curate which items you bring with you, because if you run into a roadblock that requires a certain item that you would have no idea you needed before going into the level, you now not only need to trek all the way back to the beginning of the stage to exit it, go to Tails' house, re-equip the items you're going to bring with you, and then play the stage you were just in all over again just to do the one thing. While it still would have been annoying, I feel like this problem could have been mitigated if all the levels were interconnected and it was more clear what items were required where, or at the very least if you were able to scroll through an inventory menu where you had all the items you've collected at your disposal. I don't inherently mind backtracking in games, provided that I've only now found an item that would allow me to explore new areas, but when you have to backtrack to get an item you already collected that you didn't know you needed at any given point in time, that's when the slow as molasses game becomes far more tedious than it should be. I'm sorry, what does that say? Rido. Fucking Rido. This is something else that pisses me off about this game too. The Game Gear released in 1990, was discontinued in 1997, and this game came out in 95, meaning that there's no way it was too old a game to feature a proper save system that wasn't password based. A game like this especially shouldn't rely on a password system. The helmet, which you collect in Poly Mountain 1, is another example of what I mean. This instance right here would be a great opportunity to try it out and see what the item does, even if it isn't exactly useful. But you're most likely already going to have more than four items in your inventory, and why would you ever enter a level without being fully prepared? If I want to try out the helmet, even if it were useful in this particular part of the game, I'd need to go all the way back just to equip it. Ah, one of my favorite items, one of my best friends. Also, this really doesn't make any sense, considering that Tails' adventure takes place before even Sonic 2, so Tails would have no idea who this random ass echidna on this item he just found is. Remember in Tales of Sky Patrol how I said that the screen crunch really sucked when it came to moving quickly? Well, the same is kinda true here, because one of the only times you'll move decently fast in this game is while flying, and normally it isn't a problem because you'll be able to see most of what you're heading towards, but this fight with Battle Cuckoo the 16th is the exception. Whereas in Sky Patrol you'll struggle to see what's ahead of you, in Adventure you'll struggle to see what's above you. Oh yeah, about the Knuckles item, it lets you perform the dinkiest, most useless punch I've ever seen. I genuinely don't know why anybody would use this item when you have bombs. The Mecha Golem number 5 sucks to fight. He didn't give me as much trouble this time around, but you have to drop bombs on his head while avoiding his waving arm, which can inexplicably make you fall from the air when he slams the ground for some reason. I don't know why that would affect me when I'm flying. And god damn does he take so many hits. 
So it was about this point in the game where I said, f*** it, I'm done, I don't really want to play this game anymore when I first played this game. Up until then, I'd been making my way downtown, walking fast, faces past, I was homebound. But this had stumped me because I had no idea how the game expected me to climb some of these waterfalls. I was just not getting the height I needed for them. And as it turned out, I needed an item on the Sea Fox called Extra Speed, which as the name implies, gives the Sea Fox a burst of speed when used. Now, when something goes really fast and then it jumps or elevates its height momentarily whilst maintaining that speed, physics dictates that it goes far, right? Let's use Sonic as an example. When you jump mid-spin dash, you go further, correct? You could also go higher since your forward momentum could influence the angle of your jump height. Slightly. Imagine if mid-spin dash on completely flat terrain, you jumped and somehow landed on top of a loop. Would that make sense to you? Because it doesn't to me, and yet this game expected me to know that one of the effects of extra speed is granting you a super jump after the burst of speed, which you need to do in order to clear this tall ass waterfall, which is just barely short enough for you to jump over. And what makes it extra annoying is that you're constantly fighting against the water current, meaning you have to adjust your position perfectly in order to use the extra speed and jump at the exact moment you're supposed to. Maybe I was doing something wrong, but there was no wiggle room when it came to this jump. I either did it perfectly or didn't clear the jump. Poly Mountain 2 annoys me because it's the only level that requires you to bring the night vision item with you. Granted, you have to use it every time you enter a new room in this level, but that really makes me wonder what the point of it is. You only need to use the item once per room, it's not like you need to hold a button or keep the night vision active. And the reason that bothers me is because you're effectively wasting a slot in your inventory for an item that you really don't use too often, even in the only level where you do use it. This is another instance where allowing players to carry all their items at once would have mitigated the problem. I wouldn't care how many times something needs to be used if I have it on me at all times. LARGE BOMB?! Good lord, how many kinds of bombs does one fox need? You got the regular bomb, the large bomb, the napalm bomb, the remote bomb, the triple bomb, like god damn, design another weapon! The only other thing in this game is the hammer! You know what's funny about this boss? This is the Mecha Golem, an inferior version of the Mecha Golem number 5 that we fought earlier. But really, the only thing about it that makes it inferior is the fact that it can't move. Not only do we fight it much later than the number 5, but it's got bullets and shockwaves that can hit you almost anywhere on the arena. That is, of course, unless you're chilling on this exact part of its back, just ducking and dropping bombs in front of you to hurt him. I don't think I'm supposed to be able to do this. So, the Sonic item is what allows us to use a spin dash, probably one of the more fun and useful items in this game when it comes to not just dealing with enemies, but traversal in general. What I want to know is, did we need this item to learn how to spin dash? Did Tails not know how to before? I just love to imagine that in the canon, the spin dash is something only Sonic knows how to do, and that when they meet, Tails already knows how to do it, which confuses Sonic since he thought he was the only one that knew how to do that, to which Tails replies by explaining that he learned how to do it from a box he once found, coincidentally one that happened to have his face on it. Which, now that I think about it, since the Knuckles item gives him the ability to punch, does that mean that Tails didn't know how to punch before then? He's never extended his arm rapidly while curling his hand into a fist? So it wasn't until just now, while writing the script and looking back at the footage, that I realized there has to be an easier way to do this, right? Like, there's no way that they intended for me to go against the conveyor belt with the remote robot. And yeah, that's what the wrench item is for. Problem is, it's not exactly clear where you're supposed to use it. I equipped it for this final stage because it's the last item you find in the game if you'd been collecting everything up until this point, so I figured I would need it, but when I tried using it, Tails just did a little animation. Its whole purpose is to reverse the direction of the conveyor belt, but because you can clear the conveyor belt sections without reversing them, I had no idea that's where you were supposed to use it. It's called Tails Adventures in the credits too! It's not Tails Adventures, there's only one happening! Wow. Uh, what went wrong? Why did the big remote robot explode, and why was getting covered in smoke the only thing that happened to Tails and the Flicky? If a robot explodes to the point that literally nothing is left of it, they should be dead! Hey everyone, Char i5 here. Thanks so much for watching my CinemaSense pastiche of everything wrong with these non-Sonic spin-offs. I figured that since I've already played all of these games already, I might as well go ahead and make videos on them. 
Um, thanks, as always, to my supporters over on Patreon, all the channel members. Uh, you're seeing their names scrolling on screen right now. I recently relaunched uh, the channel member badges and the emojis that you can use in the comments and in chat. Uh, the reason for that is because we've been streaming uh, all the Sonic comics over like right here on my channel. If you, if you want to check any of them out, we're live most weekdays. Uh, you can stop by, say hi, and have a good time. Or even if you don't really want to say hi, you know you're always welcome to do that too. Uh, and if you, for some reason, can't come, or if you just, you know, don't have the time, you always can check it out through the uh, live tab here on this channel, so there you go. Um, question of the video is, uh, if there was a spin-off for a Sonic character that you would like to see, uh, who would it be and what kind of game would it be? Because I think that for me, I would love to see a Chaotix game where, you know, you have to do detective work and, like, solve mysteries, maybe something kind of Ace Attorney-ish. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, but thank you again so much for watching. Um, until next time, stay safe and stay awesome. This is Charai5, signing off. Cool. They're not gonna care, you know. What? About... Streams. You don't know that, don't I? <laughs> Dude, look at the numbers. Look, <clears throat> it's it's niche. <laughs> Hell yeah, it's niche. It's comic books from like thirty years ago. But see, that's not the problem. Look at how the highlights video did. Okay, so maybe it didn't do the numbers that we were hoping it would. But, but the people that watched it enjoyed it. Oh well, good for us. I'm sure all those lovely comments are going to help us pay the mortgage next month. Dude, what do you want from me? To realize that... <sighs> We're not a kid anymore. This isn't a hobby. We're not doing this for fun anymore. You gotta get your head out of your ass, and we have to give the people what they want. What they actually want. Nobody else is doing it, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, well, maybe there's a reason no one else is doing it. Are we ever going to finish? I don't... Yes, eventually. Yeah, well... We said eventually, 15 years ago. Well, you were a child! Yeah. But we're not anymore.